So with Reading, our, you know, our three major economic engines are tourism, methamphetamine, and, you know, marijuana, the drug culture, and then Bethel Church. Bethel Church is known globally. People come to Bethel from all over the nation and the world for healing. They say that the, the anointing is stronger here. A couple who attends Bethel Mega Church in Reading is getting national attention for asking Christians to pray for the resurrection of their two-year-old daughter who died unexpectedly. We have a biblical precedent. Jesus raised the dead. So I went to Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, uh, did three years there, so it's a three-year program. The leaders of this movement claim to be apostles and prophets with extraordinary authority, miraculous powers. Some people locally call it the Christian Hogwarts. They charge tuition to teach you how to use or even receive the gifts of the Spirit. They are part of a movement called the New Apostolic Reformation. This NAR thing is basically a conspiracy theory. Yeah, the NAR is a real thing. It's not a conspiracy theory. The way it is described doesn't exist. I see an unbelievable hypercriticism. This conspiracy theory was adopted by heresy-hunting evangelicals. Endless people damning us to eternal hell fire. I mean, here I am, as an apologist, finding myself confused by this movement. My own home church uh, was decimated by NAR teaching, and the church never really fully recovered from that. I'm painted as a leader in NAR, and I don't believe any of those things. We've seen a lot of pain come out of this movement. It was the first time I feel like I truly understood the gospel, and I was sold such a cheap bill of goods. This movement impacts Christianity at every fundamental doctrine of the faith. Standing in the office of the prophet of God. Now, how are we supposed to know whether an individual is a prophet? I execute judgment on you, COVID-19. Oh. I had to come to the terms that I was not a prophet and I was also a false prophet. This is the sash that I received uh, the night I was released as an apostle. So if somebody were to say to you in the ancient world, I'm an apostle, the immediate question would be, well, who sent you? When a church changes its leadership structure to apostles and prophets, what follows is all this aberrant theology behind it. She came up, you know, manifesting her laughter, <laughs> acting intoxicated. <laughs> this goes back to April of 1993 when Rodney Howard Brown was visiting the Carpenters Church in Lakeland, Florida. He's also known as the father of holy laughter. Filled, 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 filled. And the Holy Ghost bartender. But I want you to know tonight the bar is open. If you were to be in the immediate presence of Christ, you, you wouldn't have a laughing revival. Do you not know our history? There's incidences of it happening under Finney, the first and second great awakening. This happened when Pentecost came to Canada. A bizarre religious phenomenon called the Toronto Blessing. This is where you go to catch the fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit. There was laughter, there was joy, there was drunkenness in the Spirit. There's no biblical precedent for being drunk in the Holy Spirit. These things are not novel. And that made the Toronto Blessing incredibly controversial, even within charismatic circles. And I believe that the fruit of what happened vindicates that it was of God. But just what is revival? They've soft-pedaled God's warnings, have made the reality of hell a fairy tale. The, the Brownsville Revival was the most sacred, glorious work I've ever been a part of in, in my life. We are not just bad people, we are sinners. Every single night, Jesus was exalted in worship. And until you realize you're a sinner, you will not realize you need a savior. Every single night, calling for repentance from sin. But revivalism is when man tries to manufacture that. 
At any moment, revival could come. Bring revival! Revival is just around the corner. You're constantly chasing after it. And so I thought, well, I don't want to miss the next revival. And what if it comes in a manner that we're not used to seeing and we miss it? Pastors orchestrated first revival. You cannot plan a revival any more than you can plan a hurricane. And this thing just kind of spread all over the world. I remember in 1996, we had guys from Toronto come to India. And so in Mumbai, we had something called Catch the Fire. Bill Johnson says he caught the fire and he came back to ready. I believed it was God, so I'm taking the seatbelts off. I'm jumping head first. I was ready. I had my hands up. I was like, today's the day. I'm about to fall out in the spirit. Here it goes. And they hit my stomach and nothing happens. And I'm like, do it again. Do I think some people got in the flesh? Let's get the fun back into church. I thought this is the Holy Spirit and this is how he moves. More Lord. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. <laughs> the question is, is what is the source of these experiences? Do I think some of the manifestations was not of God? God wouldn't do that. Why would God do that? And it felt like a bolt of electricity hit me in the chest. Not just me, the two ushers with me. It was as though a thousand volts of electricity is going through me. The minute I took one step in the fire tunnel, I felt an overwhelming sense of fear. Do I think some of the manifestations was actually demonic? Yes, 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 yes. And as soon as she pulls her hand away from me, she looks at me and she says, you have unforgiveness in your heart. What we really are doing is we're manipulating people. Did it have its issues? 100%. But the fruit of what God did in Toronto is evident globally. And I can point to hundreds if not thousands of testimonies of the amazing things, including my own life, that God did through Toronto. If you want to see the real power of God unleashed, it's not in fake signs and wonders. The real power of God is the gospel. John G. Lake is presented as being this phenomenal healer credited with hundreds of thousands of healings, miracles, visions, prophecies. I said, God, would you give me the mantle of William Branham? I was born and raised in the Branham message cult following. This was a movement that was not of God in any way, shape, or form. It's been said that those who are cessationists believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Scripture. And we've essentially ruled out the role and function of the Holy Spirit. But nothing could be farther from the truth. I absolutely believe that God still physically heals people today. I believe God can do miracles. I believe He will do miracles. But only when it is His sovereign will to do so. He's already revealed His will. His will is to heal everyone. But there's something about hearing a physician <laughs> say to you, I think that you'll be lucky to have six months. It's hard to hear. It is really hard to hear. Christ is the ascended king. He has triumphed. We share in that triumph. That doesn't mean that we stand in front of graves and call people out of their graves. The book of Acts is not given to us to attempt to reenact. The real question is, what is normative? My guest has raised 37 people from the dead. Where's the proof of this? I do know people who raised more people from the dead than Jesus did. Jesus didn't do miracles to show us what God could do. Jesus' statement is not that hard to understand. Greater means greater, and the works he referred to are signs and wonders. He didn't perform miracles to show what he could do. It's meant to make you think that you are at the same level of Jesus. Whatever he did, I can do. He came to illustrate what a human being could do. He performed miracles to show what you can do. And the more that happens through Christians, it doesn't detract from what Jesus did. Christ is unique. It brings glory to the main work that he did. They can't duplicate these miracles no matter how hard they try. Maybe we're not reading the New Testament correctly. I would say one of the greatest sins is the church just sitting in a pew, building this, and not actually going and doing what Jesus actually did, and not going to the poor, the sick, the needy, and the broken. Everybody skips over those verses. 
apostolic anointing. And so we just rip it right out of the ground. We just suck it right off his dead bones in Jesus' name. I don't think you have to be a cessationist, for example, to be concerned about adopting new age and or pagan and occult practices. So as an apostolic team with the authority that God's given to us. They really believe they're apostles and they believe they have apostolic authorities. We decree and declare that racism will end. It's, it's blasphemous and sad, thinking that somehow they can recreate a scene from the Lord of the Rings. No shall not pass! No more. <laughs> Do you feel like you backed into a boring, dead form of Christianity when you moved out of the NAR movement? No, if anything, I came to life. How was I so prideful? How was I so entitled? I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So, stationist, continuationist, yes. best buddies, tell the people how it happened, I guess. This isn't about Pentecostalism versus Reformed theology. This is about misrepresenting something beautiful and edifying and sovereignly given by the Holy Spirit. You know, the scripture says that God hates unequal weights and measures. And and that's what grieves me as I see some of this trailer. I know there's an attempt to be balanced, but I could make a whole documentary of all those that came out of cessationist churches and had their spiritual life totally transformed when they came into the things of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, churches that were totally transformed. And I could do a whole documentary about those that, that left charismatic Pentecostal churches and, and left some of these spiritual movements and went into cessationist church or reformed church and, and their faith became bankrupt and they fell away from the Lord. I could do a video about that. I could blast seminaries and say there are seminaries where you have to pay money to learn how to preach the Word of God or how to pastor a church or how to study the Bible. I mean, we've got to be careful when we caricature and paint certain pictures. You want to know who the real Bill Johnson is? Watch the sermon he preached after losing his wife to cancer, after years of praying for a healing. Friends, it's important we come with equal weights, equal measures. That's why I'm part of this documentary. Man, I agreed to do this interview because truly I love the body of Christ. And uh, with all of its blemishes, differences, um, I love the body of Christ. I grew up in more of a Calvinist church. And so I have lots of friends that, that might disagree with me theologically, but yet we still have a very yeah, close friendship and close relationship. And I, I love iron sharpening iron. And I think that it's really important to hear multiple aspects and multiple sides, not so that we just are in full agreement, but I think the more we hear from our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, the stronger we are and the better we are and the more we grow. And I, I agreed to do this film really because I met Brandon and uh, you came highly recommended, Brandon, from a mutual friend. And I'm a pretty trustworthy guy anyway. And so even though I know uh, that I might not have the most popular takes uh, with some of your other guests, um, I, I felt like I wanted to, wanted to come and share. As I watched the documentary, The American Gospel, I just wished there'd been one other thing that was put in it, and that would have been what Jesus emphasized. You can determine whether or not something's true or false by the fruit. It doesn't talk about the scientific study that's done by Dr. Margaret Paloma, interviewing hundreds of people four years after the revival broke out that determined that there was excellent fruit in the effects on the people's lives who were touched by the revival. It doesn't talk about the millions of people that were born again and the scores of thousands of churches all over the world that were planted as a result of this revival. Though there was mixture 
The good fruit far outweighs the bad, as is the case in all historically recognized revivals. I believe that it's also very important that we realize that we can prove almost anything we want by editing and choosing who you include and who you don't include. I just wish there had been more evidence, more sharing the fruit, because that's what Jesus emphasized. You shall know if something's true or false by the fruit.